My dear friends, this week in Torah time is a turning point. All the biblical stories thus far have been nice, but now our ancestors, the Israelites, they have to create a society built on Jewish values. So this week's Torah portion, Mishpatim, Exodus 21 through 24, begins that process. It actually is not only the first body of legislation for you lawyers out there, it actually has a name by itself. It's called the Book of the Covenant because it's mostly concerned with how a Jewish society should function day to day in covenant with God. Some of the laws back then sound bizarre to our ears, different time and place, but others are still relevant, like seeking justice instead of vengeance, or the rules Kira has chosen to chant tomorrow about acting kindly towards strangers, returning lost property, and helping animals. That's all this week. Caring for strangers is among the most important teachings in the entire Torah. It's repeated 36 times in the five books of Moses and twice in this portion alone. The reason why we are commanded to treat strangers with kindness is because we were strangers ourselves in the land of Egypt just a few chapters ago in the Torah. But the larger frame again is how do you create an ideal community, one where strangers and family, like parents and grandparents, are honored however and whenever we can celebrate them. Did you know that National Grandparents Day falls each year on the first Sunday after Labor Day? But did you also know that today in a packed chapel where you're seated in our renowned Barbara K. Littman Early Learning Center, we had grandparents Shabbat. Now it's always a risk to ask a question during a sermon when you don't know who's going to show up tonight. But I'm going to take a chance. If you are part of a three-generation family, if you have a grandniece, a grandnephew, or a grandchild, would you please raise your hand? Remarkable. Is there anyone here who's part of a four-generation family where there's a great, yeah, a great, it doesn't have to just be a grandparent, it could be a great, great, amazing. Do you realize that you're living proof, those of you who raise your hands, of yet another miracle worthy of mention for the first time in the history of the world? Four generations of human beings are living in this world at the same time. Grandparents Day in America is among the newest of holidays, and it was not invented to sell cards and flowers. It was initiated at the grassroots level by a West Virginian couple named the McQuades, who were married for over 60 years and had 43 grandchildren. In 1979, now that's just 41 years ago, friends. In 1979, President Jimmy Carter proclaimed the first Sunday after Labor Day as National Grandparents Day, since September signifies autumn as in the autumn years of one's life. I find the notion of Grandparents Day and what we did today at the Barbara K. Littman Early Learning Center very Jewish because it's an official marker of intergenerational relationship. With schools like ours organizing Grandparents Day or intergenerational events at any time during the year as a way to build community. Children have an opportunity to show their appreciation and love not only toward their grandparents or great aunts and uncles and elders, but toward other special older adult friends. And grandparents feel valued as their role is validated. Three purposes to this holiday. One, 
course, to honor three generations removed from you. Two, to give grandparents an opportunity to show love for their children's children. Three, to help children become aware of the strength, guidance, and role modeling that older people can offer. I can recall asking my grandmother of blessed memory about her own childhood, and I was stunned by what I learned around the time I was a bar mitzvah kira. My grandmother, I didn't know this, lost her mother at a very young age and had to become the 16-year-old co-parent to her five younger brothers and sisters. Her father, my grandmother's father, had little time to help since he had to run the family bakery and provide for his six children with food and shelter. And when I used to ask Nanny, as I called my grandmother, how she managed under these conditions, she was so resilient, she would shrug and say, it's simple, we had no choice. Haven't you heard stories like that from those who came before you about how difficult life was relative to how easy it is now? One of my favorite stories in this regard concerns Molly Pecan, the famous Yiddish actress of the 1920s who tells of a conversation she overheard while she was on tour. Apparently, the other performers in the theatrical company were griping about where they had to live in Manhattan. Molly interrupted them and said, I never complain about such things. My grandmother, she brought up 11 children in four rooms on the Lower East Side. One of the actresses asked with surprise, how did your grandmother manage? Molly replied, she took in boarders. <laughs> Perhaps the trait that I admire most about my grandmother beyond her humility was her resilience to bounce back from setbacks. I never learned about until I was much older. I think we could all use that positive emotion of resilience and a healthy dose of other positive emotions given all the fear, anxiety, and fright, which leads to feelings of sadness and gloom. We need to broaden positive emotions in our lives that were modeled by our grandparents, like gratitude, serenity, inspiration, awe, and love. I don't think my grandmother ever said she was bored, but that's now the most common words kids say, I'm bored. Positive emotions like resilience we get from our grandparents, they broaden rather than the constricting effect of negative emotions. Thoughts can affect actions, and we know that negative emotions narrow you while when you think of your grandparents and their positive emotions, they can broaden and grow, to grow your well-being. Um, finding inner peace on Shabbat is a positive emotion that can help. But it's not what a positive emotion does like my grandmother's resilience does to the body in we had no choice. It's what resilience undoes in helping us bounce back. It's important first to know thyself and often we know ourselves even better when we talk to our parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and greats. I don't know if you know about the Israeli-American Princeton professor of psychology and Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman. He asked an important question that each of us may answer in three different ways. And when we think about our elders, we think about the, our pasts, and some of us experience happiness when we think about 
our past. How do you experience happiness? That's the question the professor asks. There are three options. The experienced self, which is the present. Your remembered self, which is your past. And your predicted self, your future. If happiness for you is the experienced self, then you value the present most. If you experience happiness getting warmed over by memories of your remembered self with those you love, like my grandmother's Brooklyn with Mrs. Stahl's Knishes and Lundy's Restaurant, then you value the past most. And if contemplating the future is how you experience happiness, then it's not your experienced or remembered self, but your predicted self that you value most. And when you value your past self, and we Jews are into this idea, you value memory as much as you do experience. Now, I know I'm already losing the millennials here. I'll never forget when we were recruiting Cantor Strauss, Rabbi Strauss, and Rabbi Wolner. Rabbi Simons wasn't here yet. And I was showing off our grounds and our building and telling them about the oldest synagogue in the state of Tennessee seven years before the Civil War, all the people who've been here, the last large synagogue south of St. Louis, all the seven generations in our congregation. I was going off on the history, at which point one of these recruits, I won't out her, <laughs> right outside the rabbi's study said, wouldn't this be a great place for a fire pit right now? <laughs> That's the experience self. But our two inner selves revolve around experience and memory. Those of us who value experiences more tend to be more present focused. Being happy in your life is the experience self. And being in the moment, not thinking about a five or seven year plan. Others of us are happiest with our lives because we tend to value memory more than those who are present focused. But what about the future? In the presence of a bat mitzvah, what's the secret of happiness? Looking back to grandparents who couldn't even imagine life in this country. The secret is adapting to whatever happens no matter what happens. And perhaps the best example of someone who found joy in the future, despite the past, is what someone named Pete Bess said. Now, for those who don't know, raise your hand if you know who he was. Amazing. Pete Bess was the original drummer for the Beatles. He went out one day on a coffee break. Ringo Starr came in, and that was the end of Pete Bess and the Beatles. What did Pete Bess say many years later? This is a direct quote. I am happier now than I would have ever been with the Beatles. So what's the secret of happiness? Never, ever join the Beatles. Like my grandmother, Pete Bess bounced back. That's resilience, adapting positively to whatever happens in life, even despite experiences of serious adversity or traumatic experiences. And before I close, I think another key to living a meaningful, happy, purposeful life I receive from my grandmother of modest means is to be part of a community like Temple Israel. My grandparents were East European immigrant children who joined a reformed temple when they moved to Miami Beach with the great migration of the 60s and 70s of New Yorkers who moved south. Synagogues like ours, my, parents, my grandparents belonged to Temple Beth Shalom in Miami Beach, the Reform Synagogue. It was a positive place like ours because Judaism is a religion that fixates on the positive 
even if some of us fixate on the negative. You know that old Jewish memo, worry now, details to follow? It's funny, but it's not congruent with Jewish belief or thought. The last line of Adon Olam in our prayer books, Adonai Levelo Ira, reminds us that we don't have to be afraid because life's positive emotions of joy, serenity, awe, gratitude, Shabbat, inspiration, can really undo any negative emotions that are also real. So as we make the turning point this week in the Torah to the elements of a healthy society and world filled with multiple generations and positive emotions, whether you are someone who values the present or anticipating the future, whether you're someone who gets wistful looking back, may your own grandparents fill your heart with gratitude and appreciation for what you have and enjoy, not what you fear or what's missing in your life. May each of us come to know the many expressions of God's miracles from the beauty of Shabbat, the wonder of this world, to the tender wisdom of a loving grandparent. And let us say,